Welcome to the Vulcan Lecture Series, Episode 7. My name is Johannes Unterguckenberger from the Research Unit of Computer Graphics at TU Wien, Austria. And the topic for this episode is synchronization, which I personally think is one of the most important topics in Vulcan. I would even go as far as saying if you understand synchronization, you understand Vulcan. And in order to understand synchronization, we need some information from the previous episodes. So let's recap. In episode 4, we learned about different types of commands. We have seen state type commands and action type commands. The former, state type commands, can be used for making some resources accessible, such as buffers or images through the scripter sets, or it can be used for establishing some configuration for subsequent action type commands, like binding a specific pipeline. Speaking of the action type commands, these are the commands which actually perform some kind of work on a device. That can be computational work or also work that transfers data from a source to a target, or work like building acceleration structures for ray tracing. In addition to state type and action type commands, there is a third type of commands, which are the synchronization type commands. They can be used to synchronize execution or also resource access between different action type commands. Some of them are listed on the slide, like wiki command pipeline barrier, wiki command set event, or wiki command begin render pass. The number 2 in square brackets after each of these function names indicates that the synchronization2 extension has added alternative functions in each case. It enables the usage of the updated and extended pipeline stages and access masks from the synchronization2 extension. Generally, the newer functions are recommended over the older functions. And speaking about different pipeline stages, let us also recap from episode 4 that the action type commands can be divided into different groups, namely uh, draw calls using graphics pipelines or related commands, dispatch calls using compute pipelines, trace race calls using ray tracing pipelines, commands for building acceleration structures for ray tracing, and transfer commands such as copy, blit, resolve, or clear. All these have their corresponding pipeline stages, some have more, so that you can distinguish different sub-steps, and some have fewer, or even only one, to refer to a command's workload. And with the synchronization type commands, we can refer to these stages of a command to establish fine-grained synchronization between different commands. We can tell our device that it must wait at some point for some other operation to complete before it is safe to continue. An example could be that a fragment shader of a draw call must wait until a buffer copy has completed. Only after the data is available and has been made visible to it, it may continue executing, reading the data from the backing memory. Let us now turn our attention to something that we have seen before too, which is recording state and actions into a command buffer. This example indicates that several descriptor sets are bound to different set indices, and four action type commands are recorded which we assume to use the descriptor sets as indicated on the slide. Let us now think about what happens here when the action type commands access descriptor set A. So let us just focus on descriptor set A for now. And let's add the memory view. Let us further assume that descriptor set A references one specific image somewhere in memory. And as we already know, the image handle is associated with some backing memory, where the actual image content is stored. And now let us assume that command 4 also uses that same image, just not through a descriptor set, but instead directly, which would be the case for a transfer command like for example a copy. Now I will add a first wake description of synchronization to the slide through these traffic lights, without describing yet what exactly they are in Vulkan, but just to make a point for now. And the point I'm trying to make here is that command 2 may not mess around with the image's memory before command 1 has finished its business with the image. And the same applies to command 3, which shall wait until command 2 is done with the image. And once again, let us add another traffic light between commands 3 and 4. Now it is the job of these traffic lights to synchronize the commands and their access to the image so that the different commands do not interfere. And remember, a GPU is a massively parallel processor with hundreds or thousands of cores which are working in parallel. So maybe your GPU has so many cores that the workloads of commands 1 and 2 could be processed in parallel. But we said that it is important for command 2 to wait until command 1 has finished modifying the image in order to prevent wrong results. This could mean that there is not enough work for all the cores, but since we strive to produce correct results, there is just no way around this in some cases. 
So we have installed these traffic lights between our commands and it is, so to say, their job to synchronize the execution of consecutive commands and their access to the image. Only after that first traffic light has cleared the way, command 2 may start working on the image. And in the same manner, the execution of command 3 must potentially be delayed until command 2 is done modifying the image. Now command 3 may proceed. And one more time, command 4 must wait until command 3 is done. And the point here is, it is one such traffic light which synchronizes the two commands or in particular their access to the image resource, where it doesn't matter how exactly the link to the image resource is established, be it through a descriptor set or directly, every access to it is synchronized. Synchronization primitives in Vulkan are not called traffic lights, so let me introduce some real Vulkan terminology here. Let us call these kinds of traffic lights pipeline barriers. Pipeline barriers are one of several synchronization methods in Vulkan, and they would be well suitable for the use case depicted on the slide here, because, just like commands, they can be recorded into command buffers. So, now that we have recorded commands and pipeline barriers into this command buffer, let us submit it to a device queue. In such a queue, these commands are scheduled for execution, and the pipeline barriers ensure to let some of the commands wait until it is safe to continue. The barriers do, in general, not only affect commands within that command buffer they were recorded into, but they also regard all other commands that were submitted to the same queue before, or which will be submitted to the same queue afterwards. Therefore, it might be useful or necessary to include pipeline barriers to guard against execution or access to resources from previously submitted commands, or against execution or access from subsequently submitted commands. In terms of pipeline barriers, the boundaries of the command buffer they have been recorded into do not matter. So after being submitted to the queue and scheduled for execution, the pipeline barriers always guard whatever comes afterwards in the queue against whatever has already been submitted to the queue before. The exact sequence of recording and submission of commands is meaningful in Vulkan and has a name. It is called submission order. The Vulkan specification describes it like follows. Submission order is a fundamental ordering in Vulkan, giving meaning to the order in which action and synchronization commands are recorded and submitted to a single queue. Explicit and implicit ordering guarantees between commands in Vulkan all work on the premise that it, this ordering is meaningful. This order does not itself define any execution or memory dependencies. Synchronization commands and other orderings within the API use this ordering to define their scopes. Let us go back to the command buffer boundaries once again. I have mentioned that these boundaries are irrelevant for pipeline barriers, but this is not the case for other synchronization methods like semaphores and fences. Before anything within a command buffer is executed, it might have to wait on a semaphore. A semaphore is a different synchronization mechanism, which is why it is depicted outside of the queue on the slide. Such a semaphore can delay the execution of the commands that are waiting for it being signaled. So, we can also view this as kind of traffic light, just a slightly different one than the pipeline barrier. Furthermore, whenever a batch of commands has finished executing, a different semaphore can be signaled, and this signaled semaphore can be waited on by another batch of work, for example. Not only can a semaphore be signaled in such a case, but also yet another synchronization primitive, namely a fence. Let me illustrate this with some simple animations. First, the semaphore that is waited on must allow the batch of work to be executed. Now the wait is over, and now the pipeline barriers guard against overlapping execution or access to resources. First, the pipeline barrier that guards the batch against commands that have been submitted to the queue before, then between commands 1 and 2, between commands 2 and 3, and so on, until all the commands within the batch have completed. After which both the semaphore and the fence are signaled. Both semaphore and fence are now in the so-called signaled state. As hinted before, the semaphore and the fence can be used at other places to be waited on until they get signaled. Where exactly these waits can happen describes the fundamental difference between semaphores and fences.
A semaphore can be waited on by another batch of work, that is, work recorded into a command buffer and submitted to a queue. So work scheduled for execution on a queue can wait on a semaphore. Before continuing though, I would like to get a bit more precise. So far we always had command buffer boundaries on the slides, but actually this is not the full truth. Because these signal and wait operations are defined not for single command buffers, but instead for batches. And batches are just a set of command buffers. So batches are submitted to queues. And it can be defined that such a batch can wait on a semaphore being signaled before the work it represents is executed. The point here is that the whole waiting process happens on the device. In contrast to that, a fence is waited on on the host side. So this is the big difference between these two semaphores and fences. Once the semaphore is signaled, the wait on the device side is over for the batch, while for a fence, we wait on the CPU side until its signal arrives. And with that, let me show you an overview of the different synchronization methods in Vulkan. We will discuss all of them during this episode, some in depth, others rather briefly. But all of them are tools that can be used to synchronize between different commands or operations, some on the device, some on the host. Let us start with the heaviest of all synchronization methods, which are wait idle operations. When we submit a batch of work to the device, in this example using VKQ submit, the work is scheduled for execution on the appropriate queue. There, the batch is unpacked and the device starts working on the commands as soon as it is ready or has free capacities. Before we move on, please note that we now have switched from a horizontal view of the submission order to a vertical view for expressing the submission order. We will stick to the vertical view for the rest of this episode. Okay, so the device starts executing the commands. At some point, the device will have finished all of its work and returns to the idle state again. We can wait for a device returning into the idle state with a wait idle operation. In this particular case here, we are waiting for a queue to idle, not the whole device, only this queue. Let us submit another batch of work to this queue, which again is unpacked and its commands are started to be executed by the device, just like in the previous example. After everything is done and there is no work anymore on this queue, the wait idle operation will stop the wait because the queue has reached an idle state. What we use here is a queue wait idle operation. It is shown on the left hand side on the slide and can be implemented using the wkq wait idle function. There is another option which is not to wait for a specific queue to idle but for the entire device. That means on the host side we are just waiting until an entire device has no more work to do. To accomplish that, we can use the wkdevice wait idle function. So much for wait idle operations. They can be used to wait for device work to complete on the host side. The next synchronization method is still on the heavy side, but allows more fine-grained control over workloads, which was not possible with wait idle operations. Let us take a look at the same example from before, but now using fences. Again, we submit a batch of work and schedule it for execution on a queue. In addition, we define a fence signal operation for the batch. That means that this fence will be signaled after all the commands within this batch have finished executing. In this case, the batch boundaries remain meaningful. If we assume that there are also other commands scheduled for execution on that queue, the fence signal mostly depends on the commands within the batch boundaries. It might be that there is still some unfinished work on the queue, but as soon as the commands up to and including command 3 have finished, the fence is signaled, even though command x is not done yet in this example. And what we can do on the host side is to wait on that fence being signaled. So in this updated example, we are already actively waiting on the fence signal to arrive on the CPU side. And if we start the animation once again, we will see that the wait is over when the commands within the batch have all finished. By the way, it was no coincidence that command A also completed before the fence signal operation. 
Let us consider a slightly modified example where commands 1 and 2 finish earlier than command A. In this case, the fence would not be signaled yet. Let's have a look at the specification and how it describes the situation. Fence signal operations that are defined by VKQ submit additionally include in the first synchronization scope all commands that occur earlier in submission order. So that means, before the signal may be performed, the queue has to finish every command that has ever been submitted to it earlier in submission order. Only after command A has finished, the fence is signaled. These synchronization scopes are worth emphasizing, because the specification uses these to describe precisely which commands or operations are synchronized with which other commands or operations. The descriptions always use exactly two synchronization scopes. The first synchronization scope refers to some previously submitted worker operations. That previously, in this example, refers to the fence signal operation. And the second synchronization scope describes which other work or operations must wait on the worker operations in the first synchronization scope before they may be executed. In the case of our fence signal operation, the specification describes the second synchronization scope to include only the fence signal operation itself. The specification's description about synchronization scopes reads like follows. The synchronization scopes define which other operations a synchronization command is able to create execution dependencies with. An execution dependency is a guarantee that for two sets of operations, the first set must happen before the second set. Combining all of this for our example here means that all commands that have been submitted to the queue earlier than the batch which performs a fence signal must happen before the fence signal. In other words, all the commands earlier in submission order must finish execution before the fence may be signaled. The synchronization scopes are stated for all the other synchronization methods in the specification as well. Always make sure to take a look at the specification's description to get the full details about which commands or operations are affected in a particular synchronization setup. So much for fences, which are another way of waiting for device work to finish on the host side. We now move on to semaphores, whose primary purpose is different to fences. In general, semaphore signals and waits happen on the device side. This would be a prime example of when to use semaphores. We submit a batch of work to Q1 and establish a semaphore signal operation after that batch has completed. The device executes the commands within the batch and signals the semaphore. Furthermore, we submit a different batch of work to Q2 and establish a semaphore wait operation. This batch on Q2 may only start executing after the semaphore has been signaled. Since this is already the case in our example, commands A and B on Q2 can already be executed. Let us again take a look at the specification. A binary semaphore must be signaled or have an associated semaphore signal operation that is pending execution. Any semaphore signal operations on which the pending binary semaphore signal operations depends must also be completed or pending execution. There must be no other queue waiting on the same binary semaphore when the operation executes. So, we see the term binary semaphore being used here, which is one of the two different types of semaphores in Vulkan. Going briefly back to our overview, we can state that the primary usage of semaphores is inter-queue synchronization. And the specific type of semaphores that we have been using in our previous example was binary semaphores. Binary semaphores were the only type of semaphore for a long time in the Vulkan API and are still very important because some operations only support this type of semaphore but not the other type, which we will discuss later. Binary semaphores in particular are strictly device-only synchronization methods and cannot be signaled or waited on from the host side. A prime example of their usage is synchronization with the presentation engine, which was discussed during episode 2 about the swap chain. For swap chain handling and drawing, we could use different queues, a presentation queue and a graphics queue. At some point, we would like to acquire an image from the presentation queue so that we can render the next frame's results into it. As soon as the image has been acquired, a binary semaphore is signaled. 
A batch of work that we have submitted to the graphics queue is configured to wait on the semaphore signal. The image must be available before we can draw into it. As soon as the batch containing the draw call has completed on the graphics queue, a different semaphore shall be signaled, which the present instruction is configured to wait on before it takes over the swap chain image for presentation on a monitor. This is a proper setup for swap chain handling from acquiring an image over drawing into it to presenting it. In actual Vulkan code, this would mean using VK acquire next image KHR for the acquire image operation. The function has a VK semaphore parameter to establish that semaphore signal operation. For the draw call, we can use VK submit info 2, which represents a batch of work, possibly consisting of multiple command buffers. This represents a batch of work as described earlier. Because it is a batch, that means we can define semaphore weight and signal operations for it. Multiple semaphores can be weighted on, and multiple semaphores can be signaled. One of each is sufficient for our example though. The vkq-present-khr instruction can be configured with a vk-present-info-khr configuration struct, which supports weight semaphores to be set up. One interesting aspect about the swap chain setup is that the presentation engine abstracts away which device is actually used for the acquire image and present instructions. It might be that we are drawing with GPU2, but presentation is performed through GPU1. This very generic mode of operation requires the use of binary semaphores, as the specification points out. All elements of the p-weight semaphores member of present info must be created with a VK semaphore type of VK semaphore type binary. Regarding the present instruction, the specification adds All elements of the P weight semaphores member of the P present info must be semaphores that are signaled or have semaphore signal operations previously submitted for execution. So it looks like only binary semaphores are able to fulfill this requirement across different vendors and devices at the moment, but not the other type of semaphores, timeline semaphores, which we will talk about later. Such restrictions might change in the future, however, maybe through extensions or maybe even in a future Vulkan core version. But now back to our swap chain synchronization setup. Let us watch everything we have set up in action. As soon as acquire image is done, the image available semaphore is signaled. This ends the semaphore weight of the batch submitted to the graphics queue. After all the commands within the batch have completed execution, in this case one single draw call, the draw finished semaphore is signaled. This then ends the semaphore weight of the present instruction, which is now good to go, can take over the image and present it on the monitor. So, there we have it. All the swap chain dependencies have been established with binary semaphores. I would like to point out one more aspect though, so let us rewind a bit. Using the synchronization2 extension allows to state more efficient semaphore signals, since it allows to specify a stage after which a semaphore can be signaled. Before synchronization 2, the signal always happened after all commands have completed. But with synchronization 2, we can specify a specific pipeline stage. In our example, the color attachment output stage would be the right choice. Because when this stage has completed, we know that our draw call is finished writing to the image. Our draw call starts in stage none, when it is only scheduled for execution and goes through several stages as the GPU processes the workload it represents. At one point, it might be in the vertex shader stage. At a later point, it might be in the early fragment tests stage. And as soon as the draw call has completed the color attachment output stage, the semaphore is signaled even if there might be some more work after the pipeline stage which performs the signal. The color attachment output stage is the last stage of a graphics pipeline command, so nothing happens after that actually. But still, specifying the stage after which the signal shall be performed will generally lead to optimal efficiency. And with that, we return to the overview. We have covered binary semaphores and now move on to timeline semaphores, which are a relatively new addition to Vulkan. They have been promoted to a core feature with Vulkan 1.2. 
So what's the big difference to binary semaphores? The big difference is that timeline semaphores have an integer payload, which binary semaphores do not have. This integer payload is described to identify a point in a timeline and what that technically means is that this integer payload must be strictly increasing. It is a 64-bit unsent integer value and its value can even be attributed some meaning by your application, such as representing actual past milliseconds, for example. So the value does not have to increase in step sizes of 1, it just has to be strictly increasing. Such timeline semaphores support additional functionality which binary semaphores do not support. Most notably, device-host communication. The specification mentions the following supported operations. Host query, a host operation that allows querying the payload of the timeline semaphore. Host wait, a host operation that allows a blocking wait for a timeline semaphore to reach a specified value. Host signal, a host operation that allows advancing the timeline semaphore to a specified value. Device wait, a device operation that allows waiting for a timeline semaphore to reach a specified value. And device signal, a device operation that allows advancing the timeline semaphore to a specified value. A binary semaphore, in contrast, only supports the last two operations and without the integer value part, of course. To get an idea about situations where timeline semaphores might be helpful, let us first consider an example that uses binary semaphores. Let's say we are using two different queues. One is labeled physics and the other is labeled graphics. To the physics queue, we are submitting dispatch commands which calculate some physics simulation. Whenever a physics simulation frame is finished, it signals a binary semaphore. The draw call submitted to the graphics queue waits on this semaphore and starts to render the scene right after the semaphore has been signaled. Let us add additional simulation frames and draw calls to this example. This setup would work just fine if the number of physics frames and graphics frames are always totally in sync. However, it might be desirable to let the physics simulation run at a fixed interval of, say, 60 Hz and make as many draw calls as the GPU manages to. Let us see what could happen if we get fewer draw calls than dispatch calls. So, still, every simulation frame signals one semaphore. Our first draw call just waits on semaphore 1. But if we assume that our second draw call is submitted at a much later point in time, it could be desirable to just ignore some of the simulation frame semaphores and instead use the latest simulated data for rendering. So we wait on semaphore number 3 instead of semaphore number 2. Semaphore 2 is just ignored. We have wasted one semaphore, so to speak, which we didn't even need for anything. And we need to take care of cleaning it up. Things are getting worse when we have more draw calls than simulation frames. Again, we have three simulation frames, each one signaling a semaphore. But what shall the draw calls wait on? Let's say draw call 1, again, waits on semaphore 1. All good there. But what about draw call 2? If we assume that the vertical positions of the batches refer approximately to their submission time, there is no further semaphore yet which draw call 2 could use. Could we use semaphore 1 again? The specification's answer is no. It says, unlike timeline semaphores, fences or events, the act of waiting for a binary semaphore also unsignals that semaphore. Applications must ensure that between two such wait operations, the semaphore is signaled again with execution dependencies used to ensure these occur in order. Binary semaphore waits and signals should thus occur in discrete one-to-one -one pairs. So there's generally no straightforward way to handle such situations and your application might be required to do some wild acrobatics to handle such cases. Back to our example. Draw call 3 could be configured to wait on semaphore 2. Draw call 4 has the same problem as draw call 2. And for draw call 5, let us assume that it has been submitted to the graphics queue earlier than the dispatch call that is about to be submitted next. And let us further assume that our application decided that it would be desirable for draw call 5 to wait on the results of this to be submitted dispatch call 4 before it starts to render. We cannot establish such a dependency using binary semaphores as pointed out earlier on slide 72. If we use timeline semaphores instead, we get a tool which allows us to express such 
dependencies elegantly. Let's see. With Timeline Semaphores, we just use one single Timeline Semaphore and use its integer payload to express the dependencies between the respective dispatch and draw calls. The dispatch calls all update the payload with a strictly increasing integer value. So after dispatch call 1 has completed, the Timeline Semaphores payload is set to the value of 2. After dispatch call 2 has completed, it gets updated to 3. And the completion of dispatch call 3 updates the payload to value 4. And waiting on a timeline semaphore always means waiting for its payload to reach at least a given value. In our example, our application would decide for each draw call which value to wait on in each case. Our application has decided that draw call 1 should wait on the timeline semaphore's payload to reach at least value 2. Draw call 2 would wait on value 3, because the application knows that dispatch 2 will soon be submitted or finished soon, so it lets draw call 2 wait for the results of dispatch call 2. Also draw call 3 shall use the results of dispatch call 2. Draw call 4 shall wait for the results of dispatch call 3 and draw call 5 can wait for a payload value that our application knows will be set at some point in the future, but it is not even submitted to the physics queue yet. This waiting on a future, not even yet submitted value can only be achieved with timeline semaphores. Let's see this in action. We start at the given state. Dispatch call 1 completes and updates the timeline semaphore to payload value 2. This ends the wait of draw call 1. The completion of dispatch call 2 updates the timeline semaphore's payload to value 3, which kicks off draw call 2. Then we submit draw call 3 to the graphics queue, and since the waiting condition is already fulfilled, it may immediately be executed. Then our application submits draw call 4 to the graphics queue and our application knows that dispatch 3 will soon be submitted and soon finish. So we wait on a future timeline value here. The application submits dispatch call 3, which executes on the physics queue and after it is done draw call 4 may be executed. And finally. Also draw call 5 waits on a future timeline value. This is called wait before signal and the specification has the following to say about it. When using timeline semaphores, wait before signal behavior is well defined and applications can submit work via VKQ submit defining a timeline semaphore wait operation before submitting a corresponding semaphore signal operation. Okay. Now we have seen a use case for timeline semaphores and how they can make your life easier in some situations. Some more implementation details. Both binary semaphores and timeline semaphores use the same Vulkan handle, namely VK semaphore. Just different semaphore types are used at creation time to create one or the other. The payload is a strictly increasing 64-bit unsent integer and can be set to an initial value at creation time. The current payload's value can be queried on the host side with vkget semaphore counter value. The host side can wait on a timeline semaphore to reach at least some given value via vkwait semaphores. And it can be signaled and updated to a specific value from the host side using vk signal semaphore. So, timeline semaphores can be used for both queue to queue synchronization and also for host device synchronization. Let us now move on to pipeline barriers. With pipeline barriers, we now turn our focus to synchronization within a queue, not between different queues, as it was the case with semaphores. We got the basic idea about pipeline barriers already in our initial example with all the traffic lights. Now let's get a bit more precise. Let's say we have submitted three commands to the queue and the device starts to execute them. For each of the commands, it is indicated that there is some memory activity going on. Furthermore, when I start the animation, please pay attention to the order in which the commands start being executed and to their order of finishing. While the commands started in order of their submission, they can finish out of order. 
execution of command 1 started before command 2, which started before command 3, but command 3 happened to finish first before commands 1 and 2. The specification says, command buffer submissions to a single queue respect submission order and other implicit ordering guarantees, but otherwise may overlap or execute out of order. If we would like to prevent command 3 from overtaking the other commands, we can insert an execution barrier. The execution barrier states that all commands before the barrier must have completed before all commands after the barrier may continue. With this barrier in place, our updated example now looks like follows in action. Commands 1 and 2 start to be executed, but due to the barrier, command 3 must wait until all commands before it have finished. Only then, command 3 may start. So that means that the exact submission order or recording order of a barrier is key here. Or in the specification's words, when VK command pipeline barrier 2 is submitted to a queue, it defines memory dependencies between commands that were submitted before it and those submitted after it. Please note here that the specification speaks about memory dependencies, which is actually the more general term for these kinds of dependencies. Since we haven't added memory access flags to the barrier yet, but will do so later, we are talking about pure execution barriers at this point. For now, Memory dependencies are just the same as execution dependencies for our current examples on the slides. In terms of parameters passed to the VK command pipeline barrier 2 function, we would need to pass the flags VK pipeline stage 2 all commands bit to both the source and the destination stage. With that, we get a barrier just like the one displayed on the slide. All commands to all commands might lead to suboptimal performance though. Let's see if we can do better. The barrier has been updated to a dependency between color attachment output stages and fragment shader stages. If we assume that commands 1 and 2 write to some images which shall be used in the fragment shader of command 3, then we don't have to let all commands or all stages finish before the barrier, but only up to the color attachment output stage. And command 3 does not have to wait in all its stages, but instead not before the fragment shader stage. So, let us see this updated and optimized setup in action. Command 3 can execute up to its fragment shader stage and wait there before continuing. It can continue as soon as both commands 1 and 2 have completed their respective color attachment output stages. We can also specify multiple stages for source and destination flags, like in the following updated example. This might make sense if command 1 writes to a color attachment, which shall be sampled from in the fragment shader of command 3, and command 2 writes to a depth attachment, which too shall be sampled from in the fragment shader of command 3. So, in this case, we have expressed that color attachment output or early fragment test stages must be completed before command 3 may continue with its fragment shader stage. The question now is if it really made a difference for this particular example. Let's have a look at the specification to find out. It says, including a particular pipeline stage in the first synchronization scope of a command implicitly includes logically earlier pipeline stages in the synchronization scope. Similarly, the second synchronization scope includes logically later pipeline stages. So the first synchronization scope refers to the flags specified for the source flags, here shown in blue color. And the second synchronization scope refers to the flags specified for the destination flags, here shown in violet. If we take another look at the stages of a graphics pipeline, as we have also seen during episode 5, this means that if we state the color attachment output stage for the first synchronization scope, that includes quite a lot of previous stages as well, among which we also find the early fragment test stage. Therefore, stating the early fragment test stage in addition to the color attachment output stage didn't make any difference in our example in terms of execution dependencies. And for the destination flags, the second synchronization scope, having stated the fragment shader stage means that all logically later pipeline stages are included as well. Now, I have mentioned that including the early fragment test stage in the first synchronization scope does not matter here in terms of execution. 
but it matters as soon as we add memory access synchronization to our barrier. With access flags, we now move from pure execution barriers to so-called memory barriers. This is important, so let's show a big red specification citation next to a warning sign here, which is the continuation of the upper green citation box. The specification points out, including a particular pipeline stage in the first synchronization scope of a command implicitly includes logically earlier pipeline stages in the synchronization scope. Similarly, the second synchronization scope includes logically later pipeline stages. However, note that access scopes are not affected in this way. Only the precise stages specified are considered part of each access scope. So, only for the precise stages specified, we get proper memory synchronization. Chances are that in your applications, you will be using memory barriers a lot more often than pure execution barriers, because you'll always need memory barriers when synchronizing access to resources, such as buffers or images. Whenever we read from resources, we've got to ensure that all the actual memory is in our caches before we start to process it. And similarly, sometimes we got to wait until the data has been written back to the resources before it is safe to continue with other operations. So, now we can distinguish between execution barriers and memory barriers. Generally, pipeline barriers are there for synchronization between commands within a single queue. And while execution barriers are only synchronizing the execution of different commands, but not their memory accesses. Memory barriers also regard read and write access from or to resources. Before we talk a bit more about memory barriers, let me introduce memory availability and memory visibility. When some memory is loaded into the GPU's L2 cache for further processing, we say that the memory has become available. But the core clusters of a modern GPU need the memory in their respective L1 caches to actually work with the data. More precisely, in Vulkan, visibility refers to a combination of pipeline stage and access mask. So, for such a combination, memory must be made visible before we can safely process the data. Such a combination could be the fragment shader stage and the shader read access type, indicating that we'd like to read from a buffer or image in our fragment shader. So before our fragment shader performs read access, we should make sure that memory has been made visible for this type of access in the fragment shader. Let's now assume that our shader computes some color values, so there is some activity in that core cluster going on, computing new color values like it could happen in the color attachment output stage with color attachment write as access type. So there is new updated data in that core cluster, which is different from the data in the L2 cache, which means that memory is not available any longer. This is a problem if other core clusters or other commands would like to use the data because only one of the L1 caches might have the most up-to-date data in this case. So we need a mechanism to make memory available again. And this can be achieved using memory barriers. We just need to use the combination of stage and access masks, which led to the state of memory not being available any longer. Such a barrier ensures that we wait for the data being transferred and re-establishes memory availability for previous operations of the combination of color attachment output stage and color attachment write access. After such a memory barrier's first synchronization scope, memory has become available again. So, similar to visibility, availability too always refers to a combination of pipeline stages and access masks. Let us now return to our example from before, but let's add access masks to the barrier, turning the barrier from an execution barrier into a memory barrier. The access masks are printed in purple color right below the stages. What the memory barrier in this example expresses is that color attachment writes, which happen in the color attachment output stages of earlier commands, shall be made first available and secondly visible to shader read access in fragment shader stages of later commands. Let's start the animation. 
Command 3 waits in the fragment shader stage. Commands 1 and 2 reach their color attachment output stages, where they write color values. These two commands are free to continue, but command 3 must still wait for the color values written by commands 1 and 2 to be made available and visible to shader read access. So, memory from the first two commands is made available, then it is made visible to shader read access for command 3 in its fragment shader stage, and then command 3 is good to go. It can continue and will produce correct results thanks to our memory barrier. Let's look at one more example, turning command 2 into a dispatch call, which uses a compute shader. And again, command 3 wants to use in its fragment shader stage the data written by command 1 in its color attachment output stage, just like before. And now in addition, it wants to use the data written in the compute shader of command 2. Both shall be made visible to shader read access in the fragment shader stage of command 3. So the different stage and access mask combinations need to be specified in our memory barrier. Let's look at the animation once again. Command 3 waits in its fragment shader stage until the color attachment writes of the draw call and the shader writes of the compute shader have been made available and visible before it may continue. The memory barriers used in these examples here are so-called global memory barriers, where global refers to the queue, so queue global, so to speak. That means one such global memory barrier refers to all the images and buffers that are used by any of the commands in that queue. There is an option though to restrict them to single buffers or to single images or even sub-ranges of them. This has the potential to further optimize the performance of your application by avoiding unnecessarily heavy synchronization. In code, such restrictions can be expressed by the help of VK dependency infostruct, which allows to specify a range of global memory barriers, a range of buffer memory barriers, and a range of image memory barriers. So, so much for memory barriers, which synchronize not only the execution between commands, but also their memory accesses. We have two more synchronization methods to go, one of which is render pass sub -pass dependencies. Render pass sub -pass dependencies are actually nothing else than image memory barriers in disguise. Let's see. Returning to the VK dependency infostruct again, let's do the following. Let us forget about global memory barriers, and let's also forget about buffer memory barriers. And let's furthermore not use VK dependency info any longer, but instead let us use different structs starting with VK subbus dependency 2, which allows us to specify stage and access flags. Then let's observe that with the function VK command begin render pass 2, we get to pass a pointer to a VK render pass begin info config struct, which contains a reference to a frame buffer, which was created with the help of a VK frame buffer create info config struct, which contains references to images. So, nothing else than a different way to specify image memory barriers in the context of a render pass. And speaking of render passes, let me just quickly describe what they are on a fundamental level. Render passes can be used with graphics pipelines, namely to describe which frame buffer attachments are used during rendering and how to synchronize between multiple subpasses and with external commands. One example of frame buffer attachments as they could be used for a deferred shading setup is displayed on the slide. We have four frame buffer attachments, one depth stencil attachment and three color attachments, one for storing normals, one for storing diffuse color values and one for the final render output. Assuming that our application is going to use these attachments in two subpasses, subpass 0 and subpass 1, we create a render pass containing all this information where we also state for each of the attachments how we're going to use them. For example, the depth stencil attachment is used as depth stencil buffer and then as input attachment. The normals attachment is used as type color attachment in its first subpass and then as input attachment too. For the diffuse color attachment, we specify the same usages as for the normals attachment. And the attachment receiving the final color values after the lighting pass is unused first 
and used as type color attachment in the second sub pass. To complete a render pass description, we now add synchronization descriptions. We can describe external synchronization, which are execution or memory dependencies to commands earlier in submission order or later in submission order. And furthermore, we can describe internal synchronization between the different subpasses, which we have two of in this example. The synchronization declarations are very similar to those from pipeline barriers. Again, we have to specify combinations of stages and access flags, just like for memory barriers. And with the additional information of which images are affected, as shown before, the driver can establish possibly more efficient image memory barriers instead of global memory barriers. That already concludes the description of render pass subpass dependencies, which are image memory barriers in disguise and within the context of render passes, which can be used with graphics pipelines. This takes us to the last synchronization method in Vulkan, events. An event is fundamentally a split barrier, where the commands before the VK command set event are synchronized with the commands after the VK command wait events, while all the other commands in between these two are unaffected in terms of synchronization. In the example on the slide, command 4 waits in its fragment shader stage for command 1. and the two commands in between the calls to VK command set event and VK command wait events just execute without any synchronization dependency. All commands start being executed in submission order as always, but the event itself has no impact on the execution of commands two and three. Let's take a look at the animation for this example. All the commands start in order. Command 4 is fast, but has to wait in its fragment shader stage and can only continue after command 1 has completed its color attachment output stage, while commands 2 and 3 were totally unaffected by the synchronization. Not totally dissimilar to timeline semaphores, events allow some host interaction, so they are not device-only synchronization primitives. To signal an event from a device, VK command set event 2 can be used as seen in our example before. To wait for one or more events to enter the signaled state on the device, VK command wait event 2 can be used, also used in our example. An event can be unsignaled from a device through VK command reset event 2. And on the host side, the state of an event can be set to signaled from the host using VK set event. The state of an event can be queried from the host using VK get event status, but there is no function to wait on the host side. And finally, to set the state of an event to unsignaled from the host, the VK reset event function is there at your disposal. This concludes our discussion about the last of the synchronization methods, events, which are basically a split barrier and enable other commands to execute in between. Furthermore, they support some host interaction. Since synchronization in Vulkan is such a broad and comprehensive topic, I'd like to recommend some further great resources about it. Please follow the links on the slides to these resources. Furthermore, there is a validation layer which can be very helpful in spotting potential synchronization problems in your application. It can also be enabled in the Vulkan Configurator tool. This concludes episode 7 of our Vulkan lecture series, where we discussed all the synchronization methods that Vulkan provides. Synchronization can be quite a challenge to get right, but once you get the grasp of it, your application can have fine-grained control over your devices. And if you get it right, it will lead the way to correct results and awesome performance of your Vulkan applications. Thanks for watching.